Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Krzysztof Obedzinski. Um, I've been here for a long time. I think most of you know me, so I don't need an introduction, but perhaps for colleagues who may be online and watching this, I'm in the governance portfolio, and I'm working with Pablo Pacheco and other colleagues in a flagship on forest trade and investment. So like uh, Robert mentioned uh, in the introduction, today I'm going to be talking about uh, one of the papers, a paper that we published earlier this year, which talks about uh, oil palm investments in forest or remaining forest frontiers in Indonesia and the implications of these investments for economic growth, poverty alleviation, and um, um, economic development essentially in those regions. Um, just a little bit of background before I jump in the paper, I would like to say a few things about oil palm. You know, I'm not going to say a lot because we all know what oil palm is, but I think, uh, I think uh, we all agree that oil palm is one of the most controversial uh, tree crops in the world. It's um, a major part of global national, subnational discussions about economic growth, uh, agriculture expansion, energy, poverty alleviation, a whole range of things. And it gives sort of rays to uh, uh, you know, a variety of views, perceptions, and, and, and emotions. And uh, there's no question that economically, uh, oil palm is, is one of the most important agricultural commodities. Uh, and its importance uh, is, is continuing to rise. Um, and uh, oil palm is essentially is found in, in, all, in many things that we use daily. In fact, uh, it's a, there's a very interesting uh, infographic on the uh, Guardian website which shows that uh, oil palm is found in around half of the things that we use daily from, uh, you know, for food, snacks, um, cosmetics and other things. Oil palm is there, so it's everywhere. Uh, and as a result, oil palm often is called a sort of a wonder crop or golden crop, you may say, because of the sort of high returns per unit area, because of uh, quick returns and also because of uh, uh, sort of comparatively high, re, uh, high yields per unit area compared to other crops. So as a result, it's, it's an important part of the economy. It's a, it's a very important part of the agriculture sector in Indonesia. It's a, in fact the foundation of, uh, of uh, growth in agricultural sector in Indonesia. And it's, it's a major part of uh, development policies in Indonesia. Uh, on sort of acceleration of economic growth, uh, MP3EI, which was launched by the President SBY back in 2009, and also you know, underpins this philosophy of rural development in Indonesia, which is said to be pro-growth, pro-poor, and pro-job. Usually, you know, this kind of economic view of the economic potential uh, associated with oil palm is also in many cases uh, linked with some concerns about sort of environmental implications and social implications. And I'm not going to go into those too much, just to say that um, it's sort of the, the most prominent of, among these concerns is the uh, issue of deforestation, forest degradation, and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, additionally, there are these lingering issues associated with community rights, land rights, labor rights, and sort of the distribution of benefits from oil palm. So we kind of take note of all this sort of dynamic field of discussions about you know, what oil palm does and doesn't do and all these concerns. And we, in this particular paper, we focus specifically on the economics, uh, economic side of uh, oil palm. And we, we particularly focus on the mission that oil palm has been given in Indonesia, which is to drive economic development in rural sort of uh, isolated, let's say, parts of the country and be this driver of pro-poor, pro-job, and pro-growth economic development. And we do that by sort of looking at this question, to what extent oil palm investments in, 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 in rural areas actually are an efficient means of, of driving economic growth uh, and poverty reduction and, and, um, and creating uh, incomes for rural livelihoods. Um, we do that, in fact, uh, in the province of Papua, which is one of the last remaining forest frontiers in the country, and also one of the major destinations for oil palm investment uh, because of the lands that are still available there. 
essentially what we do in this paper, we use input-output analysis to understand the linkages between oil palm sector and other parts of the economy. And we also combine input-output analysis with the National Economic Survey data to understand the implications of oil palm investment on household, on, on, on household income uh, levels. So essentially what we find is not very surprising. It's not ground shaking and it's not revolutionary, but I think it's still quite interesting. And in terms of economic growth, uh, we, what we find is that yes, oil palm can, very, you know, can be a, a very important uh, driver of economic expansion. Um, but what happens is that it's, it's very much, the growth is very much confined to the plantation sector itself because of the lack of integration and sort of limited connectivity between oil palm sector and other parts of the economy in the province. This growth is very much centered in oil palm and in plantations and it's not really contributing to, to, to kind of a multiplier effect in other parts of the economy. Um, in terms of employment, yes, uh, oil palm can generate a lot of jobs. Uh, there's no question about that. In fact, what we see is under under each scenario that we examined in this paper, and in fact we looked at five scenarios ranging from 50,000 hectare expansion all the way up to something like 5 million hectares expansion, we are talking about a lot of jobs that will, need, will be necessary, and we are actually facing a question of labor shortage and uh, possibility for, or necessity for labor importation or contract labor or uh, in migration. And that, uh, th that also has some implications for relationships with the local population. And in terms of income distribution, what we see is that oil palm can raise household incomes, yes. But uh, when you look a little bit closer, you'll find that the impact of oil palm investments tends to be highest on households which are kind of medium to high level income, uh, meaning households which have, have had some kind of education and have had some kind of experience and also some resources to invest and actually take advantage of these opportunities and, and create benefits for themselves. Most of the poor sort of local uh, indigenous communities do not have these kinds of skills. So we kind of round up and we say, okay, in terms of implications, we, we, we acknowledge the sort of theoretical or, or the potential of oil palm to really be a driver of change in these places, but under certain conditions. We say that basically oil palm investment uh, in those kind of rural areas, forest frontiers, has to be thought about in kind of a long-term integrated way. You know, it can't be done in this sort of boom-bust situation where, you know, all of a sudden people are, you know, there are big investments going on, land is allocated, and yes, it's going on for a few years and then everything fizzles out and sort of a, it's not clear what, what has happened. But it has to be a part of a long-term process, integrated planning approach, which emphasizes um, interconnectivity between, between, between different sectors of the economy, you know, linking oil palm, other plantations with other parts of the economy to ensure that investments in a particular sector will trickle down and will drive economic development in other parts of the economy as well. Um, we also emphasize smaller size concessions. There's a lot of experience in that part of Indonesia with sort of poor performance and, and poor uh, productivity on, of large scale uh, uh, investments. So, um, you know, uh, it, and also this is associated as well with the necessity for social safeguards, which um, in the setting of uh, uh, forest frontiers are important because in those areas you still have very much indigenous and sort of customary landowners and customary structures which are predominating. And so those social safeguards are needed in order to ensure sort of uh, prevent uh, negative, possible negative implications of these investments. Um, this is in a nutshell. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, I, um, <coughs> If there is some unclear, you know, uh, unclear parts of my presentation, I will do my best to clarify it in, in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for respecting the, the 10 minutes perfectly. Questions? Comments? Yes, Will.
Did you compare your OPAM sort of um, transformation, or you what you want to call it, to other um, pathways that have happened somewhere else, like you know, in some other agro-industry or whatever coming in there? Um, in this particular paper, we really just focused on this particular part of the country. We referred to some literature from neighboring countries like Papua New Guinea, and to see to see a relatively similar context to see uh, to see what kind of transformations took place there and what were the implications of these oil palm investments. And we found we found some similarities. In fact, that you know um, uh, that these oil palm investments do take time to actually result in some tangible benefits for, for these communities, you know, who, which need time to acquire skills and, and knowledge about this new crop. So we looked at some literature from the region, Papua New Guinea and so on. We didn't really look beyond that, uh, you know, uh, into the sort of uh, other geographical areas. <clears throat> Thanks, Christoph. Interesting presentation. However, in an oil pound, we are talking about there's a boom situation and there's no bust situation. And I, I would like to ask if you can reflect a little bit how is that oil pound development in these frontier areas compared with that, what would be the multiplier effects on all frontiers with oil pound had already been established? That I think the situation can be quite different and probably Papua future could look a little bit like situation in areas where oil pound has already been established. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for this question. Yes and no, Pablo. You're right that, you know, the story of oil palm so far is all about boom because it's, it's generally speaking, it's expanding and it continues, in, it is expected to continue to expand for some time. But uh, in those areas, for example, in this part of Indonesia, you will see that a lot of land, a lot of land has been allocated over the last 10 years. And actually, very little has come through in terms of effective uh, actual plantation development. A lot of it has been this kind of, I would call it boom, bust situation associated with, for example, ex this excitement about biofuels back in 2008. And then, uh, um, what else? And then it, it all collapsed uh, as a result of the financial crisis in 2009, 10, or something like that. Done now, it's rising again, and, and more and more companies get activated. Um, but it has a lot to do in this kind of forest setting, forest frontier setting with mm, land speculation, I think, and uh, sort of a diversification of investments in other parts of the country and other, and other commodities. So um, we, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question, but I think I think there are some elements of this boom and bust there which, which, uh, which, we, <clears throat> which we paid attention to. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I'd just like to ask whether, whether you, either you or other people, have actually looked at uh, how smallholder, really smallholder um, um, oil palm has entered into sort of diverse um, smallholder economies and diverse, the sort of diverse um, use of labor with either within families or within small groups. What I'm referring to is, for instance, in the past, um, rubber, for example, got adopted and it was actually integrated into into um, other kinds of resource use. So rubber became jungle rubber and, and all in Indonesia. Is there any view of that, how um, it's no longer quite the, either the, the economic um, model or the agricultural model, but a new model that smallholders have developed around oil palm anywhere in Indonesia? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of literature uh, on, on smallholder oil palm in Indonesia. There's a lot of research, ongoing research on this topic in, at C4 right now. And I, I think uh, a number of colleagues here would be very well placed to address this. I think <clears throat> in the area where, which, which is the focus area of this particular paper, there's essentially, there, smallholder oil palm is extremely new. 
and it's essentially just sort of emerging in front of our eyes because it's, it's, it's a frontier area and it's, it's brand new. So, uh, but if we look at other places with longer history of oil palm, Kalimantan East or, or, or uh, Sumatra, um, you will see, we will see quite a range of arrangements uh, in terms of uh, smallholder growing of oil palm. You know, independent oil palm, completely independent, also sort of different outgrower schemes with companies. And all these things have different sort of implications and different outcomes. Um, you know, there's a general assumption that outgrower schemes, or, you know, between communities and companies usually are not particularly beneficial and that you have, you know, if you are an independent grower, that, that is much better and so on. That's not always the case. There are cases where you have outgrowers growing oil palm for companies for this, you know, sort of partnership agreement, which is, uh, which is quite beneficial and they're making, you know, decent income. On, in other circumstances, it is not. So it's quite varied and it's, um, I think generally speaking, you would say that in Sumatra, West Kalimantan, you have a well-developed smallholder oil palm, which is, uh, which is, you know, well-established. And as you move east, in Indonesia, these things are newer and, and less sophisticated, less developed. Any, any technological change in the I think not so much yet. I'm not quite sure. I don't profess to be a, an expert on technological, you know, tools being used in smallholder agriculture. But I think it is still very much uh, sort of a manual kind of a job, although. I think there is more and more certain sort of technological improvements are being applied. Yeah. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned that uh, Papua is, is really a frontier area, that Kalimantan is something more or less in the middle, and, and Sumatra is already a, a well-developed area. Eh? Do you think it's, it's, it's just a trajectory um, that eventually Papua will become the same, uh, will look the same as East Kalimantan or, 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 or Riau? Or what do you think will be factors that, that, that will shape the landscape in a different way, or oil palm developments in a different way? Um, well, you could, on one hand, you can imagine that, that yes, you, you see, you know, oil palm started in Indonesia in, in uh, North Sumatra, Hundred, about 100 years ago, and it spreads east and, uh, and, uh, and then to Kalimantan and now to eastern Indonesia as well. Uh, but it's, I mean, the socioeconomic and political conditions in these different places are, are quite different. And, uh, and of course, you've got now at play other forces which, which are uh, pushing for greater conservation of you know, forested areas and uh, you know, uh, linking to climate change. Um, so I don't think that we will see exact replication of what happened in Sumatra, you know, to you know, in Kalimantan uh, and, and and Papua. I think there will be there will be um, some replication, and you will see in some areas which have uh, essentially you know uh, mixed population and. Uh, some of some of these kind of uh, models which have been developed in Sumatra and Kalimantan replicated but um, but it's you know it's hard to say because uh, you know Papua is kind of a specific place uh, uh, with special autonomy and, and particular regulations for protecting indigenous land rights so I, I don't see the oil palm kind of spreading all over and kind of taking over the whole place I think uh, there will be some expansion and some replication of these models but on a smaller scale. Hi, Christoph. My name is Chen Shengo. I'm a visitor from Utrecht University, the Netherlands. Utrecht University, the yeah. Netherlands. I have a more general question. Um, from your point of view, what are the opportunities and barriers for smallholders, uh, oil palm smallholders development in Indonesia? What are the barriers and opportunities? Barriers and opportunities for smallholders. I really should kind of convey that question to my other colleagues. But I, um, you know, on one hand, there are, there's a lot of opportunities, emerging opportunities. Uh, you know, the market is good. 
the, the crop is producing, um, uh, the returns are quick, uh, so, the, so, so farmers, the, or let's say uh, rural people in Indonesia in many parts, are extremely excited about this and, and so the growth in the small scale sector, and whether it's independent or, or linked in one way or another to, to, to larger companies, is, is very strong. Uh, so there's a lot of excitement about it. Um, but of course, in terms of barriers, um, the fact is that these smallholders are, you know, are having some problems with linkages to, to broader markets. So for example, uh, you know, the, in order for them to sell their product, <coughs> produce, you know, they either have to have these partnership agreements with companies and be part of like outgrower schemes, or they can be uh, independent farmers, but they still have to have arrangements with um, oil palm mills and, and traders, middlemen, in order to get their products to the mill. So the crux of the matter usually is in between there. You know, what kind of arrangements do they have um, to get their product from the site to the mill, from the site you know, to the mar market? Um, and there are also some regulatory, I think, problems with the way these partnership agreements and partnership relations between smallholders and companies and processors of, uh, are, are codified in, you know, in terms of this partnership, uh, you know, you know uh, terms of this partnership. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Christoph. Thank you, Christoph. It's, uh, yeah. oh, here's my question. Um, you mentioned that um, people who get involved in the oil palm eco economy tend to be those with uh, higher education. And you also mentioned that there is the possibility of a labor shortage given how uh, rapidly it's growing. My question is, is what proportion of a village community, what proportion of the households gets involved in the oil palm e economy given this, these, um, that the labor force is going in two directions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I should qualify, I shouldn't say that people with higher education get involved in oil palm. People with some sort of education or with, 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 with some schooling and some exposure to you know, to external markets, to, to uh, uh, interaction with other communities, uh, are more likely to engage in the oil palm and be more successful, let's say, or uh, effective in it. It's, it's still a very small minority uh, overall. You know, if you, you know, based on, on our data in this paper, if we look at these communities uh, in, in the southern part of uh, the province, uh, it's still very much, uh, a small, small fraction of these indigenous communities that actually get involved. You have a higher percentage of uh, people in sort of mixed villages or mixed communities that are actually pursuing oil palm, uh, while, while in those villages which are a little bit more remote, it's still kind of adjacent to oil palm, but, but on the site, um, the, 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 the level of engagement is very, very low. It's still very much subsistence oriented sort of uh, you know, hunting, gathering, fishing, and uh, farming to some extent. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, I would like to see a little bit from different uh, view uh, of yeah. this uh, um, uh, expansion in Papua. I, I imagine that it is also challenging to invite investment, investor to Papua, and maybe the oil pump is maybe the most, uh, the, the best choice that's, that, uh, that happened there. So uh, you, you say that it is good, improve the pro productivity improve, but uh, less multiplier effect. So are you proposing that we have, uh, the government of Indonesia have to, to stop this expansion? So more uh, considering other options, do, do you have any second best option for investment in, in that particular area, which maybe infrastructure is uh, less uh, compared to Kalimantan and Sumatra? Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, 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 you know, by no means we are saying that Indonesia, the Indonesian government should, should stop oil palm, should somehow stop the oil development of oil palm. I mean, that's impossible, first of all, because oil palm is, has become too important and it's, uh, um, 
you know, and it's going to be increasingly important uh, in the years to come. But I think there's, uh, there's, uh, there are important lessons that can be learned, you know, looking at oil, uh, Sumatra, looking, looking you know, historically at, at these other places that have been already um, uh, affected or affected, uh, that, that, that have hosted oil palm development. Uh, so <clears throat> um, what we are saying in the paper that no, I mean, oil palm, sure, it, it is an effective means of driving economic development in many ways. In, you know, creating employment and 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 reducing or improving uh, reducing poverty or improving people's livelihoods in rural areas, but it but we have to learn from the past and we, it, it it requires certain conditions, certain approach, sort of stepwise approach, integrated approach. So, um, and I think Indonesian government knows that, understands that, and they are doing doing that anyways. You know, in their own way. Uh, within the spatial plans that they have, and now they are linking that to the discussion about green economy, green development, you know, which areas can be devoted to oil palm, which ones cannot or should not. So I think, I think we want to link to that discussion and sort of say, okay, how can, it, can this be done in a, in, a, in a more effective and sort of a more effective, but at the same time more sustainable way uh, we, we, th I think this is the message, this is what we are trying to say. We are not saying oil palm is bad, don't do it in Papua. I mean, that's, I, I, I don't think it's an effective uh, message to, to, con to, uh, uh, to communicate. Okay, thank you. We are almost at the end of our <coughs> science at 10. Give a big round of applause to Christoph again. <clears throat>